those three areas. Um, a lot of times when, when we interview students or we have people come in and, and want to shadow us, they think that all day long we're just out there fighting fraud and investigating fraud cases. But a lot of times that's not, the, not uh, what necessarily happens every day. Um, a lot of our time is spent um, calculating damages. Um, so like if you got in a car accident and you were no longer able to work, what's the value of that to you? Um, so you have to calculate how much work you've lost, uh, any type of career impacts that that may have had and calculate the damages to you. Um, so that's one of the areas that we work in. Um, or like if somebody infringes upon your patent, how much is that worth? Um, so a firm like Sage will, will calculate those damages. Uh, and then business valuation. So a business valuation can be just a consulting setting where somebody wants to come in and understand what the value is of their ownership or what their business is so they can sell it or just for just so they can know um, but it can also be in a litigation setting where you have a dispute between partners and one partner wants to buy out the other one and so they hire someone like sage to come in and value the business value the the shares and the ownership interest and and present that value to the to the parties so they can hopefully settle before it gets to court and if it if it doesn't settle then we'll explain that to the judge and the judge can rule on what the value is um, and then there's obviously the the forensic accounting and fraud piece where we'll investigate if if a business owner suspects that there's been fraud occurring in his business then we'll we'll go in and investigate the the books and records and help him to evaluate that um, and so so that's kind of where our time lies. <clears throat> um, but like Vicky said, I've been involved in, in several cases of, of fraud and forensic accounting. And this case is just so perfect because it, it uses um, so many different tools that you need to use as a forensic accountant. Um, it didn't even start out as a, as a fraud investigation. It started out as a business valuation where one partner wanted to buy out the other partner. And so our client came to us and just wanted to know what his shares were worth and see if it was reasonable the offer that he that he received for his shares. Um, but as we started getting into it, it kind of shifted into a fraud investigation, um, and we were, we were able to uncover a fairly significant fraud for the small business, where they could recover some of those damages and and then ultimately value the business where the partners could split and they could go their separate ways. Um, but so our our objective today is I'll provide an in-depth case study um, that's focused on specific tools or technical expertise that you can use as a how-to guide to uncover fraud. Um, and I wanna focus on just this one case because I've, I've been in, I've heard a lot of different presentations and I've, I've had different continuing education courses that go over a lot of different cases all at once. And it, it's almost like drinking from a fire hose. You get so much information in that it's hard to really understand it all and 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 implement it, um, whether you're a student and just trying to learn some tools, or or even for a seasoned forensic accounting experts. Um, if you're if you're having so much information all at once, it's hard to really digest. So we're just going to focus on one case. We're going to take it from start to finish. Uh, I'll give you the background of what was going on, and we'll kind of open it up as a discussion. Um, we've got a few participants, about 51 of us on here. Um, so if you have a question as we go, uh, don't hesitate to unmute and ask your question, and I'll try and take those as we go along so that um, we can get everything cleared up as we go. And at the end, I'll, I'll ask for additional questions as well. Um, but so to, to start, from my experience, this is kind of how a typical fraud investigation uh, happens. Um, it's it's kind of along the same lines as this Mutt and Jeff cartoon where Mutt is down there looking for his quarter. He says, I'm looking for the quarter I dropped. And Jeff says, did you drop it here? No, I dropped it two blocks down the street. Well, then why are you looking for it here? He says, because the light is better here. And that is, it's funny, but it's, it's the, that is what we see all the time in a fraud investigation where we get some data that's really good. We get other data that's really bad uh, and hard to work with and maybe needs a lot of, um, love and care before we can get it into our model and analyze it and we kind of shy away from that data that's not very good and we focus on on just stuff that we that's already readily available and, and easy to look at 
Um, but a lot of times in a fraud investigation, that's not where you're going to uncover uh, the fraud or, or anything nefarious that's going on. You have to get into the weeds. You have to get into the obscure data uh, where it needs some love. You need to massage it a little bit before you can get it into a format that you can analyze. Um, so, so I like starting that out as the as a presentation because just know in your fraud investigations um, you're going to have to get into the weeds and you're going to have to look where the light is is not very good. Um, so, where is the best place to start? If you know that you're going to have to kind of get into the data and, and look in the weeds a little bit, where do you think we should start in a fraud investigation? So we'll kind of open it up. If you have a comment, just unmute and and chime in. Does anybody have any ideas on where um, where you think the best place to start would be if you suspect fraud? I would think financial statements. Yeah, yes, financial yeah, statements. Like yeah, that's that's a great place to start. Um, a lot of times you can look at the financial statements and and kind of see balances that don't really make sense. Um, in our practice, we like to use a common size financials where you. You look at everything as a percentage of revenue if you're looking at the income statement, or you look at everything as a percentage of assets, uh, total assets, if you're looking at the balance sheet. And you can review those trends over time. So you're, you're looking at that percentage, uh, that common size percentage over time, and you can pick out um, where one year it was, it was even, or maybe the last three years, it was always 5% of revenue, and then all of a sudden it jumps up to 20%. That's something that you're going to want to look at. So, so yeah, financial statements are a great place. If Any it's other, a company that um, has inventory, would inventory be a good place to look? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it depends on the business that you're investigating. But if it's if it's an inventory intensive business, and that's where a lot of the value is, um, you'll definitely want to look out, look at the inventory, uh, get behind those numbers, and see if that inventory actually exists. Yeah, that's a great place to start. Your bank statements. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of times, especially in small businesses, um, they don't have the accounting expertise to really reconcile or, or perform proper accounting uh, practices. And so a lot of times you'll see that the bank statements don't actually match the financial statements. Um, so say you're, you're looking at the financial statements um, and you're not using the bank statements, you could be totally off on your numbers because they're not actually uh, real transactions. So yeah, looking at the bank statements is a great place to start. Um, so from the ACFE handbook, um, it says that the best place to start is to look for anomalies, uh, look for red flags. Um, and and you, can, you can do that with any of the, the sources of information that we've looked at. So like I said, with the financial statements, you're looking for anything that sticks out as an anomaly. If you see an increase in some sort of percentage, that would be an anomaly that you'd want to look, look, drill into a little bit further. Um, same with inventory. Uh, if you notice that uh, that there's things that they say are in inventory, but then when you go and count them, they're not actually there. That would be an anomaly. Or if there's just spikes in inventory that are uh, unexplainable of why those, those are happening, that'd be a place you'd want to look. And then bank statements as well. If there's, if there's significant tra transactions and maybe th there's a certain transaction that happens on a certain day every month and the, the business owners or accountants don't really have a good explanation for what that is, that might be an anomaly that you'd want to look into. A little bit further um, but so with everything that you're doing um, you're always looking for red flags or anomalies um, and it doesn't have to be with just data as we go through this case there will be several red flags um, that kind of pop out and we'll identify each of those red flags as we go uh, and you just kind of keep those in the back of your mind um, and it will it will tailor the case to uh, to the red flags. Uh, so for example, if you have a lot of red flags, you're gonna want to do a lot more investigative accounting work to be able to get behind all of those numbers and tie out all of those anomalies or red flags to be able to feel comfortable that you haven't left anything behind. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll dive into this case a little bit. I'll give you an intro uh, to the main parties that are involved. Um, there was our client who again came to us to value the business so so we could tell him what his shares were worth he was a 50 50 partner with his brother 
Um, and then there's obviously the brother who was, who was a partner in the business. And then there was the accountant. So those are the three, the three main parties that are involved in this case. And we'll go, we, we'll get into their backgrounds a little bit here. So our client, he was recovering from a prior stroke, which made it really hard for him to remember. Um, he, he had a short-term memory loss where he couldn't really remember the day-to-day -day operations of the business or what happened the day before. But he did have a really good understanding of the business in general because he had ran it for 30 years before his stroke. Um, so he, he knew the business in and out and he had these long term memories of what the business was and, his, and the customers and, and all of that. He, he knew the business, but he just couldn't remember the day to day things. And because of that, it, it was hard for him to just be involved in what was going on. Uh, he wasn't very technically savvy, so he couldn't go into the computers and generate a, a, the financial statements. Um, he couldn't review any of the data really from the business itself. So he was really reliant upon the brother and, and the accountant to tell him how the business was doing, if it was growing, uh, was it profitable or not. Uh, and so he was kind of in a vulnerable position. Uh, the brother, he also didn't have any formal business education. Um, so him and his brother had just been in this for 30 years and had grown the business to a pretty significant operation for, for them. Uh, it was doing about seven and a half million dollars of revenue every year, which is a pretty decent small business for two, two brothers that, doesn't, that don't have any business education. Um, and he was somewhat involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, but he also had other side businesses where he had real estate and a recycling company that he would operate. Uh, and I think there was something else that he was involved in as well. So, so his time was focused on those and he wasn't really involved in the day-to-day -day of the hardware store either. Um, and so he, he also wasn't technically savvy, so he couldn't go in and generate the financial statements or look at the general ledger or understand a lot of the reports that the accountant would give him. Um, so he was also reliant upon the accountant to tell him if the business was, was profitable, if it was growing, uh, what the biggest customers were. Uh, and so, so he's really reliant on that accountant. And so with that background, you would assume that the accountant is really versed in accounting and has some good education. Uh, when we got into it, we realized the accountant also didn't have any formal accounting background. Uh, I can't remember what her major was, but it was it was like home economics or or something like that, where she's sewing and and making blankets. Uh, but she didn't have any business or accounting training, uh, so she was the main accountant. Everybody's reliant on her, and she has no formal education in in accounting or or in business. Um, she had just been with the company for thirty years. And because of that, she ran everything. She ran the she ran the day to day operation. She collected the cash for the business. She made the journal entries. She took the deposits to the bank. Uh, she produced the financial statements for the owners. Every aspect of the business, she had her hands in it. Um, and then apart from that, she also had a side business uh, of her own that took half of her time or the majority of her time, where she was running that side business outside of the hardware store. Mm. Um, so, so just with the background that we know right now, uh, we we're, we know that constantly, whatever case we're working on or whatever we're doing, as as forensic accountants, um, we're always thinking about red flags, anomalies, uh, what sticks out. Um, so, with what we know so far, what what sticks out to you guys? Everything. <laughs> the accountant. There was, yeah, there was a lack of segregation of duties, definitely. Right. Uh, what about uh, side business? That seems like conflict of interest. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Every, every, everything is wrong in this case, which is why <laughs> I like to present it because it's just a smorgasbord of fraud. Whatever you want, it's, it's in there. <laughs> it, it, it's um, but yeah, so there's definitely. Um, so, so this is red flag number one. Uh, there's no segregation of duties. Uh, the owners are disengaged from their from the business. Um, they have no formal business education, which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing, um, but it just it adds to the to the depth that we want to get into with the data. Uh, since they don't know what's going on, we want to really be confident that we we know what's going on, so that we can we can make an informed decision and tell them as our client. 
Um, they don't have any, they have several side businesses that are conflicts of interest. Um, and so, so that's kind of that red flag, that anomaly. Uh, we don't know if there's any fraud uh, occurring at this point, um, but with all of those red flags, uh, we want to really get behind the numbers. We're not, we know that we're gonna dig a little bit further we're not just gonna rely upon the income statement and balance sheet. We wanna get the general ledger and really look at the detailed transactions, how things are being accounted for uh, so we can, we can understand the business. Uh, I do have a question. I have a yes. question too. Yeah. I don't, I don't know who was first, um, but. The other, the other lady. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, it says there were several other conflicting side businesses. So. Did the accountant own other side businesses or did the owners have other side businesses? Yeah, so we'll back up the accountant. They, she did have a side business. Um, that, was, that was a conflict of interest. Um, and then the owner, the brother had a side business that he, he had three or four side businesses that he was involved in. Um, and our client, he, some of the brother's side businesses were also in our our client was involved in those as well, but he, the brother had out other side businesses that, that our client wasn't involved in too. So, okay. so yeah, there's just lots, lots going on here. My question was having the side businesses, were those side businesses necessarily doing business with this other company or were they just separate? Because is there a conflict of interest if they're not related at all? Right, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, to an extent, they, they were conflicting. Um, for example, one of the brother's side businesses was uh, a recycling business where he would, he would sell scrap metal to recycling plants and get money from that. Um, through our analysis, we found that he was, he was taking some of the, the hardware store's rebar and recycling that and getting money from that and, and keeping all of those profits for himself. Um, mm. so, so in a sense, that, that, was, that was conflicting. Um, he also owned uh, a lot of real estate, uh, like apartment complexes, and and so he would he would often take inventory from the hardware store and and use that to build out his his real estate projects. Uh, and he just he just wouldn't account for any of those transactions. So so yeah, there there were these conflicting uh, side businesses that that were involved. I have to say that. Um... My family is a little bit of an anomaly. I know I could trust both of my siblings with things, but I found that cynically speaking, you really can't trust anyone, even the person who shares your last name. And mm -hmm. there's so much power there mm -hmm. that the client is relying on the brother to do. While I know like my sister would do what she said she was gonna do, I just, don't believe other people would do that and so the the trust there is astronomical actually yeah i mean it, it's really hard once you get into this field um you become very skeptical of of all of your relationships with everybody just because <laughs> you see so much fraud and you see so much um where people are trusted each other and then they just disregarded that trust and, and committed fraud anyways. So, so yeah, you see that a lot. Um, but yeah, so, so we'll, we'll move on here. That's, a, that's our first red flag. There's no segregation of duties, uh, disengaged owners, conflicting side businesses. So we know that we're gonna wanna get into the details and, and just understand all aspects of the transactions, make sure the accounting's correct um, so that we can, we can put together a good analysis for our client. Um, so to do that, uh, we requested the backup of the QuickBooks file, uh, and a few days went by and we didn't receive anything. We'd follow up through email, ask her to send it to us, and weeks went by and we still hadn't received the, the data that we were asking for. Uh, and so that's our second red flag. If there's a lag in, in data that's readily available, um, that they can't get that data to you, um, often that's a sign that there, there's something going on. They wanna be able to cover up their tracks first, make sure that, that what they've done can't be found before they let you look at the data. So it takes them longer to be able to verify all of that. Um, so, so obviously if, if there's a lag of, of data that's, that should be readily available, like a QuickBooks file, it only takes a few clicks um, 
to, to generate that. And so they should be able to get that to us within an hour, but I mean, it's been weeks at this point. So, so that's kind of our red flag number two. Uh, after almost a month, uh, and we've been going back and forth, following up with emails and phone calls, trying to, to get this data. Um, and it was always, I'll send it to you tomorrow. It'll be there. I'll send it to you. I've got this deadline or whatever. I'm busy at the store. And so she always had tons of excuses on why she couldn't send it to us. And then ultimately she said, well, I just, I just don't know how to make a backup file. And so that's why I haven't given it to you. And so we said, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll come and show you. Uh, and so we scheduled an appointment with her to, to meet her at the hardware store and show her how to make a backup file and, and get the data that we needed. Um, but that was red flag number three, where it's, if the accountant doesn't know how to make a backup file of QuickBooks, which should be something that's really simple, a uh, simple accounting task, um, then the data might not be accurate. So that's not necessarily a red flag for fraud, but it's a, it's a red flag in our, in our business valuation that we want to uh, really understand the transactions and, and make sure that they're correct, make sure all the entries are, are being entered right. And if hey, you didn't um, know, you didn't ask. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Luke, when did you, uh, when, when did that uh, little bell start going off in your mind that you were probably dealing with something that was wrong? When would you say? Um, so, so that was definitely here uh, at this side. So, so the morning of uh, the, the meeting that we had when we were going to go and meet the accountant to get the QuickBooks file, she had sent us the, the file. So mm -hmm. we were supposed to meet her at eight o'clock in the morning. At seven in the morning, we had an email with the QuickBooks file. And so we, we opened it up and we exported all the financial statements, especially the, the general ledger. And we saw that the general ledger had been condensed. Mm -hmm. um, and so the condensing utility, uh, a lot of people don't have never seen the condensing utility or heard of it, uh, even, even forensic accountants or, or CPAs uh, in the field. A lot of them aren't familiar with this uh, condensed utility in QuickBooks. Um, but what it does is it, permanently consolidates and deletes all of the transaction details from the general ledger and it summarizes it all into one journal entry and and you can summarize it by month or by year or just all the previous data it's all just now one journal entry and so so you don't have any of those historical numbers um quickbooks recommends that you only use the condensed utility as a last resort and so they recommend upgrading your hardware, get new computers, get faster processors, get more RAM, do everything that you can to speed up your hardware. And if your QuickBooks file is still running slow, then as a last resort, run the condensed utility and summarize some of that historical data. And even then you'll probably only run it on, on the data that's 20 years old that you're never gonna look at. And then you keep the last, 10 years or so um, as, as actual data. So, so they never recommend to just wipe out the entire history. Um, but every time that I've seen the condensed utility ran, it's always been by a fraudster who wants to cover up their tracks. They don't want you to see what's in the general ledger and they use the condensed utility to, to delete all of that data and so that you can't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen it used about six or seven times and every single time, it's been to cover up fraud. Wow. So, so once we saw that the condensed utility was used in this case, um, that was red flag number four. Um, that's when it pivoted from just a business valuation to there's something else going on here that we want to review. Um, and we don't know whether it's the brother that's, that's directing everything uh, or if it's the accountant. We don't know who it is, but we know that, that this utility is, is mainly used to cover up fraud. Uh, and with the with all of the red flags that we've seen up to this point, the the lack of segregation of duties, the untimely data, the inability to produce the QuickBooks file, and then ultimately the condensing, that's that's just the the perfect uh, opportunity for fraud. Um, and I'll I'll make one more point here. I kind of skipped over this slide to to get to our red flag, but I wanted to mention that the condensed utility. Um, prior to 2019, it, you could not alter the audit trail. So you could condense the general ledger, 
but all of the detail in the audit trail that would show every change to every transaction, that was always left intact. There was nothing that the, that the accountant or the QuickBooks user could do to delete the audit trail data. But in QuickBooks version 2019 and forward, it will give the user the option to delete the audit trail if they want to. Um, Any idea why they decided to do that? I mean, that's um, mainly because well, I, I've emailed QuickBooks a lot about this issue because, like I said, every time I've seen it, it's been fraud, um, and so it's a tool that's that's very abused, uh, and they they shouldn't be able to delete that that data. Um, basically, QuickBooks says that only the admin user has the the rights to condense uh -huh. and so yeah. they, they try and safeguard it that way um but a lot of times in the small businesses the, yeah. the admin user is the the only user um and they're the ones that are perpetrating the fraud so, so yeah, they, they it, have it, the it, ability it, to cover their checks it doesn't stop it at all i mean that <laughs> It just yeah. doesn't make sense because the admin user in a small business is going to be the person using it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of times yeah. in a small business, they don't even create different mm -hmm. passwords for different users. They all just mm -hmm. use the same one. Yeah. Um, it, just, it doesn't make sense. So, so yeah, that's just a heads up. Um, if you, if you get a QuickBooks file that's using 2019 or later, which is becoming more and more common as we, as we go on, um, the, the they can delete the audit trail so you'd want to if you see the condensing utility used you want to get in there as fast as you can and 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 try and get a backup copy uh the good thing about the the condensed utility is when you run it it will always make a backup copy before it condenses all the data and it'll save that copy to the hard drive somewhere um you can delete that copy uh so if the if the user was was smart enough they could condense and then delete the backup that was created um but a lot of times if you're fast enough you can you can identify it was condensed and get in there and, and salvage the backup copy that was created and also it, even if you delete something it's still on the hard drive until right. it's overwritten yep so yep. you can still do forensic analysis on the hard drive to pull some of that data it, it might be partial it might be the whole thing, but at least you could get part of it from the hard drive yep. so long as it hasn't been completely overwritten. Yeah, and, and so, so that's what we wanted to do in this case. Immediately, once we saw that the condensed utility was used, um, huge red flag, we, we contacted our client and walked him through the, the severity of, of condensing the data um, and told them that we need to go in as soon as possible and, and image all of the hard drives uh, and so we can try and look for that, that backup copy or at worst case, try and salvage it because it hadn't been completely deleted yet. And so, so we, we went in at midnight after hours uh, with the computer forensics team and we, we imaged all the hard drives in the, in the store. We imaged the point of sale system computers and all of the office computers. Uh, we got all of that data and went back and analyzed it all. Um, luckily, we, we were able to find several backup copies of, of the QuickBooks file. Um, and what's interesting is we, we were brought into the case around the first week of, of August of 2017. Um, as soon as we contacted the accountant and let her know that we wanted a backup file of QuickBooks, she had ran the condensed utility and, and made that and condensed all of the data. And then pretty much weekly, she would run that condensed utility to, to cover up her tracks as, as she went on. Um, and then, yeah, at 7.05 in the morning on August 31st, she condensed it one last time and then sent us the, the condensed utility. So she had she'd been condensing weekly um, to try and cover up all of her tracks um, before she would send it to us. Um, along with the image hard drives, we were also able to uh, review her search history. Uh, you can get into the, the search history for Google and Bing and all of those other web browsers. And we found this great nugget of information, how mm -hmm. to delete the audit trail in QuickBooks, <laughs> which is amazing. I mean, that's, per that's what you want as a fraud investigator. This mm -hmm. is just like a present sent down. Yeah. Um, and so if, if you ever see this, how to delete the audit trail in QuickBooks with all of the other red flags that we've seen, <laughs> um, there's definitely fraud in these, in this, in this QuickBooks file. And we want to, we want to uncover it because it, it's there.
So, so we're not going to we're not going to stop digging until we find it. At and this point, did you have a what we used to call a runner? The was the bookkeeper on the run by now? <laughs> she wasn't. I don't know. If she just didn't think that we were good enough, or that we wouldn't mm. find it, or what. But she, yeah, she stayed put, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so, so we had that great nugget of information. How to delete the audit trail in QuickBooks, which again, huge red flag. Uh, now it's definitely a fraud investigation and not just a business valuation. Uh, and we're going to keep researching and, and reviewing the records until we uncover some sort of fraud because it, it's got to be there. Um, so, so let's kind of recap what we know so far. Um, we know that there's tons of red flags. Uh, there's no segregations of duties. The owners are disengaged and they're all reliant upon this one person who handles everything in the hardware store. And she has condensed the QuickBooks file and researched how to delete the audit trail. Um, so that is just the perfect indication that, that there's something going on there that we wanna, we wanna look at. So at this point, where do you think we looked at first? What do you think? The audit trail, of course. Yeah, the audit trail, <laughs> and then her own financials. Actually, yeah, she living above her means. Is what what's going on with her? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we looked we looked at all of that stuff. Uh, we did start with the audit trail because that was we already had we already had the data, um, and they weren't using QuickBooks 2019, so she couldn't condense the the audit trail either. Um, and we had all the backup copies because we imaged the hard drives. So, so we had the data to look at the audit trail. Um, that's where we went first. Um, but I'll, I'll give you some background here of the audit trail because a lot of times um, people aren't very familiar with, with the audit trail or what it looks like or the data that it keeps. Uh, when we gave this presentation to the Dallas chapter ACFE, uh, there was like a hundred or so people in the meeting and only a handful of them were even aware of, of what the audit trail was or that it even existed. So uh, it, it's one of those reports that are in QuickBooks that nobody really looks at. Only the fraudsters know it's there um, because they <laughs> to delete it. <laughs> uh, but regular run of the mill accountants, they, they don't really use it too much. It's not, it's not a go-to report. Um, but what it does is it, it logs every single transaction in QuickBooks. Uh, so basically if you sneeze, it's gonna record that in the audit trail. Uh, every, everything gets recorded in the audit trail. Uh, it will record by user. Um, it will record the exact time that the change was made. Even if you change the name of a vendor, it, it's gonna record that change in the audit trail. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's gonna record it for every single vendor that ever existed, um, every single transaction that ever existed for that vendor in the audit trail and make a log of that change at a specific time. Uh, so because of this, it can get really big, uh, even for a small business, a small hardware store like this, um, the audit trail was like 670,000 lines of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, it's not formatted very well that you can just scroll through and, and really see all of the changes that are being made or, or make sense of what's going on. Um, so you need to use some sort of tool to summarize all of the data that's being captured in the audit trail so that you can see if any of the anomalies stick out and try and try and hone your search in a little bit more because there's just a mountain of data available. Um, and if you don't know where to look, it can be overwhelming. Um, so what we used, uh, and this is a tool that can be used no matter which uh, case you're working on or whether it's QuickBooks or some other sort of data set. Um, if you can get it into Excel, then you can use a pivot table to summarize the data and look at it from different perspectives. Uh, and pivot tables are great for that because you can filter it. You can switch around the, the views uh, where if you're looking at it by year, maybe you drill down and look at it by month. Maybe you look at it by specific transaction numbers uh, or changes to the transaction. You can, you can count the number of transactions. You can add up the transactions. Uh, there's just so many things that you can do with pivot tables and so many ways that you can look at the data. It's a, it's a great tool, uh, not only for forensic accounting, but for, for anything. Um, so my number one recommendation to students is, is really get good at using pivot tables because um, 
they are the number one tool that's used in everyday practice. No matter what it is, you're always going to use pivot tables. Um, and just having an understanding of how the pivot table works, that's going to translate into so many other programs that are being used now to, to summarize and analyze large data sets. So if, if you really understand how pivot tables work, you can use other programs that are popular right now, like um, uh, Power BI is one, or Tableau is another one that's being used. Uh, basically, all those are, are pivot tables. Um, it, it's just a specific program that uses pivot tables. Um, so if you really understand how they work and, and what it's doing, then you can use any of those, those popular programs right now and be very proficient at them. Um, so this is a good time. We'll, we'll dive right into uh, an actual pivot table. So we'll, we'll open up uh, the audit trail here and we'll kind of look at that. Um, so this is... This is the actual audit trail from the from the investigation that we were that were that we were, were doing from the hardware store. Um, we'll drill down. So so this one actually it only has four hundred and twenty thousand lines um, <laughs> that are being captured, but still, I mean, it's it's a ton of data. Uh, and when when you're working with the database, you like that there you'd like to see that there's no gaps, there's no blank spaces in the data, um, that everything is formatted perfectly. Uh, with the audit trail, you see that there, there's there's tons of blank spaces everywhere, and gaps and and kind of duplicated data, and so it's 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 hard to work with just from a from a data set standpoint. Um, and if you're just scrolling through, uh, you don't even know what to look for with with what might be fraud and what might be an actual transaction. Um, so this, this is why we need to use a pivot table to be able to summarize it all and tell us exactly where we should look, so we're not just blindly scrolling through transactions trying to trying to understand if when this transaction was changed from 2083 dollars to 2091 dollars was that a, a legitimate transaction or not we we don't know really and there, there's probably 420,000 other transactions that are just like that so so we need to use a pivot table to to hone our search a little bit more um so, so this is our pivot table. The first ones that we'll that we'll look at um, every time that I'm I'm looking at the the audit trail. What I want to start with is the number of changed, deleted, um, or unaltered transactions by year, and I want to look at if there have been any significant changes to the data. So, say they're they're at 100 transactions every year that are that are altered, and then all of a sudden in one year there's 500. I want to maybe look into that year that has 500 and see see what's going on in that year. Um, so so let's run that report. Um, we'll grab the the date and we'll just put that down here. Uh, so this is the rows column of the pivot table. When we drag that date field in, uh, you'll see that our pivot table now has the date of every year that's in that data set. So we have from 2006 to 2017. Um, and then we're going to drag the state of the transaction, and we're going to put that in the columns field. And so you'll see that now we have our pivot table with the date in the rows field and the state in the columns field. That'll show us which transactions were deleted, which ones were changed, and which ones were not changed. Um, and we want to count all of those transactions by year and by category. And so we can see if there's any anomalies that stick out, anything that we want to look at a little bit further. Um, so let's grab our transaction number in here. We'll drop that in the values. And right now you'll see that it's, it's creating a sum of all of the transaction numbers because the, the transaction number is, is numerical. And so the pivot table, it wants to add up all of those transaction numbers, which really results in, in numbers that are nonsense. Um, you can't really make anything of it. So we want to change that. Instead of the sum of all of the transaction numbers, we, we click on that values field and we say value field settings. And instead of the sum of all of those transaction numbers, we want to count the transactions. Um, so instead of summing them, this is going to give us a count of every transaction by year by category. 
Um, so just flipping through the data real quick, um, what, what years do we want to look at further? I would say probably the change 2009 and 2011 with the deleted. The yeah. 2016 stands out a lot. Yeah, with the changed. Yeah, so so these two years are definitely the most dramatic. The, there there are some increases here in nine and eleven in the in the deleted, and then in the not changed, we've got a ton of transactions here that were entered. Um, but just from a changed transaction standpoint, I want to know why it went from six hundred transactions in fourteen to five thousand transactions to fifteen to ten thousand transactions in sixteen. And that to me doesn't doesn't make sense, and so I want to I want to understand why why we have so many change transactions in 15 and 16. Um, so so now I can I can do a few different things. I can go back to the audit trail and I can filter down my date to show me all transactions that are in uh, in uh, 15 and 16 and scroll through. It might be like a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand lines. Um, or I can create another pivot table, uh, to help me narrow my search even further. So what, what other sort of pivot table do you think I could run to, to narrow my transactions down to 15 and 16 and maybe look at it from a different perspective? Uh, for vendors? Yeah, you can look at vendors, specific Customers, vendors that were changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dollar value? Yeah, dollar value. You could, you could look and see if it's uh, a specific dollar value that's being changed or the high, if it's the high dollar values that are being changed all the time. Does it both work? Probably um, those that involve uh, the checking account, right, Luke? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, uh, I mean, the cash has to get out of the business somehow, right? right? That's and where so, they're going to be probably so more than likely. Cash account. I have a question about the changed. Yeah. In 2015, with the jump from 661 to 5036, you have 55 deleted. But then in 2016, there's only two deleted, but it's jumped over double. Mm -hmm. Changed. Yeah. I mean, what, what is what is that referring to? I mean, can can you define yeah, I mean, what that, happened? That's what, we're gonna, that's what we're gonna try and understand is why, how can that happen? How can how can it double here and have no deleted transactions? You would think that if they're if they're making a ton of entries, um, that they would be deleting those entries as well. Um, so that you would you would think that there would be a corresponding jump in deleted. Um, but that that's the whole investigation that we're that we're trying to go through is is understanding the questions and and look um, and we need to reconcile it with what we know. So if we find an answer to that data, uh, if we find an answer to explain why it jumped from 5,000 to 10,000, does it also explain why our deleted transactions didn't increase as well? So, so you wanna keep all of those questions uh, that we're coming up with right now. And when we find an answer, you kind of reconcile everything that you've learned up in the case and, and all of the questions that you had about the data as you're going through. When you find that the ending answer, you wanna go back through and, and, and answer all those questions. Does what I found make sense for the jump in, in 15 and 16 transactions? Does it make sense that what I found uh, would result in no transactions being deleted? Um, and is that the only fraud that could that could be occurring or do I need to look further for, for other anomalies? So yeah, that, that's a great, great question to have. Um, and, it, and it just flows with, with the, uh, how you should, should be investigating these, these issues. Um, but so what we did is we, we know that there's a ton of transactions that are being changed in 15 and 16. Um, what we wanted to do is, is figure out which specific transaction numbers were being changed the most. Uh, and then we would look at those specific transactions that were being changed the most and see what was changing, see if we could make sense of it. Um, so we'll create another pivot table here with, with transactions that are being changed. So we'll get our transaction number 
and we'll put that in the rows. And so what this does is it gives us a list of all unique transaction numbers in, in that data set in the, in the audit trail. Um, so whether there's one transaction or a hundred transactions, uh, it's gonna have one number here uh, that represents those, that group of transactions. Um, and then we're just going to count um, our states here for those transactions. So we'll drag the count the state into that. But, but before we do this, I, I like to come up with some sort of hypothesis. Um, before I, I run analysis, I, I kind of think through it in my mind. What do I expect to see? Um, so typically, and what I've seen working with, with uh, businesses is you might have some instances where you need to go back and change a transaction. Say you, you accidentally input the wrong amount, so you have to go back and, and correct it. Um, so I would suspect that there's two or three, maybe four changes that would be legitimate. Anything over four, I would, I would suspect that I'd want to look into that a little bit more. Um, and so I kind of think through that in my mind before I, before I run the analysis. Um, so let's drag in here the state. And then let's sort this. Uh, so right now we see that there's some sixes and eights. And so, so those we might want to look at, but let's sort it from high to low and see which transaction numbers are being changed the most. Um, so we sort that from largest to smallest. And now we have a ton of transactions Ooh. that are being changed 19 times, uh, which is which is well above our baseline hypothesis, what we would expect to see in, in a normal RAN company that doesn't have fraud. Um, 19 times seems excessive to me. So, so I want to drill down into that transaction number, 42011, and figure out why it was changed 19 times. And if, if I can understand that, then maybe I'll, I'll figure out what's going on here. Luke, is it possible that she just did not know what she was doing and had to make so many corrections? Oh it's, it's possible, um, but that's the, that's the beauty of having the, the search history and her, her deliberately trying to delete the audit trail. That kind of yeah. takes any suspicion away that it's just uh, user error or incompetence. Um, she, she's definitely trying to cover her tracks. And she's specifically trying to cover her tracks in the audit trail, which is why we're looking at that specific report. Um, but yeah, leading leading up to, to that, we there we had thought that maybe it was just incompetence that the, the records maybe weren't right. Um, but even even with the incompetence, changing a transaction 19 times that's that's a little excessive. Um, and it's not just one transaction, but it's um, I mean she's changed nine transactions 19 times. And there's another handful that have been changed 18 times, 18, 13 transactions changed 18 times. Um, that's a little excessive, even from a, a competence standpoint. So even if we didn't have the audit trail, um, this would still be over just competence issues. Um, so let's switch back to our um, PowerPoint here. Because we can drill down into this number and we'll see the, the transaction. So this is the, the actual transaction detail. Uh, the great thing with the pivot table is you can just double click on any of these numbers here and it will, it will give you a summarized table of all of the transactions that make up that number. Mm. So, so this, these are all of the 19 um, transactions, the raw data for the 19 transactions. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at this a little bit further in the slides because um, I formatted it a little bit easier to read. Um, a little back there. Let's see. Um, let's see. So, so here's our, our summary of transactions deleted, changed, and not changed. We looked at 15 and 16 and we drilled down into those. Um, that was our red flag that we wanted to look into. And then we, we pivoted it again to look at the number of transactions that were changed. Um, we came up with our hypothesis of what, what we expected to see. Uh, and we came up with this list of transactions that were changed 19 times, which, which was above, which was excessive even for, for competence issues. Um, so here's a summary of those 19 transactions. Um, 
you can see that it starts at one down here at the bottom. This was the very first transaction that was entered. Um, it was originally, well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you look at these transactions for a little bit and, and you can shout out if, if anything sticks out as, as odd, something that we'd wanna look into. So just to be clear, uh, Luke, this is one transaction from 2015 that was changed over the course of three years. Is that <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, why would you be changing a transaction over three years? Definitely, yeah, that's definitely something that's odd is the original transaction you'll see was entered August 29th of 2015. Um, but the last time it was changed was March 21st of 2017. So yeah, three years later or so, she's still changing this transaction. And why would you need to change a transaction 19 times? I mean, that's yeah. bizarre. Yeah, definitely. That, uh, that so out when you're point. saying that the transaction was changed, are we saying that a payment was sent out for that transaction every time for a different value? Um, so, so no, that, that was surprising. Uh, and I don't have the value on this slide, but the value stayed the same every single time. So she wasn't changing the value at all. Um, what's interesting is, is the vendor name was being changed. Um, so the only change to the transaction was the vendor name. That was, that was the only thing that changed. Um, you'll note that the, the date of the transaction always stayed the same. Uh, even though the vendor name was being changed in, in March of 2017, the date of the transaction was the same. It was only the name that changed. That was the, that was the only change to the transaction. That's a big um, red flag. That says to me that they're trying to shuffle money back and forth between something to look like they either had more inventory, more... Um, uh, net worth or something, but the fact that it's switching back and forth between these two is is very strange. Yeah, and if you look at the... So does that lead to an audit of the vendor list to see how many new vendors are coming in each year? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it definitely lends to other analysis that we want to do. Uh, look at vendors and see if there's any false vendors or vendors with the, the accountant's address or any of the owner's addresses. Uh, look at all of that. Um, uh, but with, with this transaction, the vendor name is definitely uh, suspicious and the date that the transaction was being entered on also gives us some insight into why, why this vendor is being changed. Um, so you'll see that um, at 1049 on, on December 12th of 2015, 1049, it was, the vendor was originally Orgeal but then it was changed to Smith. And then just four minutes later, it was changed back to Orgeal. So there's, there's only a split, a, a few minutes where, where the vendor name is actually changed. And that pattern continues with, with most of these where 1027, it gets changed from Orgeal to Smith. And then by 1043, it's back to Orgeal. Uh, again, 1021, it's Smith. 130, or 121, it's Smith. 135, it's back to Orgeal. So there's only a few minutes in between these transactions, uh, in between these changes where she's she's changing the vendor name to something and then changing it back. Does um, it matter if it's uh, a PO box, the address? Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely a vendor, uh, an analysis that you'd wanna do on the vendors. Um, look, at, look at PO boxes, look at all of that. And, and a lot of times legitimate businesses may use a PO box, so that's not a, a fail safe uh, catch all analysis that can be done. Um, but with, with this one, um, she, was, she was changing the same vendor name. She wasn't changing the address or anything else. It was just the vendor name. Um, and what we had found, when, once we identified this transaction, what we wanted to do is look at the bank statements, uh, compare the bank statements to what was on the general ledger. And what we saw is that on the bank statements, the bank said Smith, the, the, the actual check from the, the copy of the the canceled check from the bank statement said Smith. But when you looked in the general ledger, it said Orgil. And Orgil was, was a, a supplier, somebody that they'd, they'd use all the time for, for inventory and, and everything else. So there was nothing nefarious about the Orgil name, but the, it was suspicious that the check was named Smith when the, when the general ledger said something else. And so what was happening is 
she would go into QuickBooks, change the vendor name uh, to, of a vendor that regularly had transactions of about $7,000, seven to $14,000. She changed that to, to Smith. She wrote a check, uh, which she then used to pay her landlord for her side business. Um, and so it wasn't written out to her, which, cause that would have probably been caught in the, uh, when the owners, even if they weren't involved or very savvy, they could have realized that she's writing herself checks. Um, but since it was to her landlord, just a, a random company name, they didn't catch on that those were not business uh, used for business purposes. And so she would, she would change the vendor name, write a check to her landlord, change it back. Um, and she, she just figured nobody would ever know that she was doing that. So Luke, who was signing those checks? Um, so, so the brother signed the brother signed every single one of those checks, uh, okay. which, which wasn't too suspicious because he signed. There was only a handful of checks that that our client actually signed. The brother was more involved in the day to day operations, so he signed most of the checks, anyways. Um, but yeah, because he said, I mean, we we obviously interviewed him as well, and he said that he just didn't know that that wasn't a, a legitimate vendor because um, it was just a common business name and so you wouldn't even suspect if you weren't really involved in the day-to-day -day. So brother just signed off on anything that the accountant put in front of him thinking that it was the right thing to do yeah well she, she knew everything and he trusted her i mean she'd been there for 30 years and so he had no reason to to suspect anything was was wrong and it happens with small businesses because you have to trust your employees. So the brother trusted that the accountant who was not professionally trained mm -hmm. yep. um, knew what she was doing and said, oh, okay, you're putting this in front of me. I'll sign off on it. And mm -hmm. that's where the problems really started. Um, and so, so the, the ACFE classifies this scheme as, as an altered payee uh, type scheme. And I've, I've added this little chart here, and this is the, the short URL uh, to get to that chart. Um, but it's a handy tool to have because you can, it gives you all of these known frauds that could, that could occur. Uh, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive list of, of what's out there. Um, and so it gives you a good idea of, of what to look for. So an altered payee is, is where you're changing the name on a check. Uh, and it's a type of asset misappropriation that, that could occur in, in a business. Um, so, so just to summarize, I think we're, we're running close to our time here. Um, so we, we started out um, just, just as a summary of the scheme, we, we found 42 checks that, that she had written to her landlord through this, this process of changing the vendor name in QuickBooks. And it was about $330,000, um, which, was, which was more than the brother was offering our client for his share of the business. So, I mean, that, that's not an insignificant amount to this specific company. I mean, that's a, that's a good chunk of change. Wow, $330,000 um, is a lot of money. And, and we found the earliest check that we found was, was February 28th of 2013. So it had lasted for over four years, going on five years before we uncovered it. Um, and it was only uncovered. The last check was August 11th, 2017, which we got involved probably the week before that um, and probably requested the QuickBooks from her around that same date. Uh, and so if, if we wouldn't have gotten involved, this probably could have gone on for, for as long as she was there involved in the company. I don't think it would have ever been uncovered um, just because the owners were so disengaged. They didn't know what was going on and they trusted her so much that, that it could have gone on forever. Um, but, but after this, obviously she was let go and, uh, and they pursued a judgment against her to get, get that money back. Um, so like I said, once we, once we come to a conclusion, we want to reconcile all of our red flags um, with the, the fraud scheme that we've uncovered to see if, if there's still more that could be out there that we want to look into, or if, if we're satisfied that what we've uncovered uh, will reconcile all of our red flags and there's nothing else to, to look at. Um, so the disengaged owners and staff, there's definitely other frauds that could be perpetrated that we'd want to look into. 
Um, and, and we did investigate some of those a little bit more. Um, the lag in production of, of financial data, the incompetent accountant and the condensed. Um, there was definitely a ton of errors in the QuickBooks file that had to be corrected when we did our business valuation. Um, things that weren't accounted for properly, a lot of personal expenses that were just being ran through the business um, that were for the accountant's benefit, as well as the brothers and even our client had had a few. Um, and that's not necessarily fraudulent. If you if you own the business, a lot of times they'll put personal expenses through there. Um, but we, we made note of those and corrected those. Um, but the, the condensed QuickBooks, um, and then also researching how to delete the audit trail, uh, we're, we're pretty confident that the altered payee scheme that we uncovered was what she was trying to hide. Um, there was nothing else that stuck out in the audit trail of, of things that were being deleted uh, or changed. Uh, we looked at a lot of those, those uh, anomalies that, that you guys had picked up on of, of spikes and changes in certain years. Uh, nothing was really there. Um, so, so the altered pay scheme was really the only thing in, in the audit trail that stuck out. Um, and then the large number of change transactions, uh, there was the comment of, well, how could you have doubling transactions in one year and no deleted transactions? And what we found is that in August of 2015, QuickBooks changed their audit trail to track um, changes to a vendor name. Mm. Uh, so before August of 2015, that those changes weren't being tracked in the audit trail. Wow. Um, but after that change, then it started started tracking all that. So so that's why even though the fraud had started in 2013, and she was she was perpetrating that fraud fraud in 13 and 14 and most of 15, we only saw the jump in transactions in starting in 15 once once QuickBooks started recording that. Do you um, think um, do you think Luke that QuickBooks did that made that change because they someone had requested it because that they do did think that that might be a way that people suspect, were committing fraud? Yeah, I would suspect um, that that they would make those changes based on, on information that's coming from users. Um, but but yeah, that, that's an example of a great change that QuickBooks made, uh, and then the ability to delete the audit trail. That's kind of a, a bad change that QuickBooks made. So they're they're always changing their program, how it how it accounts for stuff, what you can do, and so it's it's important to be knowledgeable on on what it does, what it tracks, uh, and its its limitations as well. Um, but then also just just the number of transactions uh, made sense because for every single vendor. QuickBooks has to go through and and change that that vendor name. So you get this exponential increase in in changes if you're changing a vendor name. Um, so that's why we see a jump from 5,000 to 10,000 because of that. Uh, and and then that would explain also why she's not deleting any of those transactions because she she all she's doing is changing the vendor name. It's recording a change, but she doesn't have to delete anything out of the audit trail. Um, so, so to summarize what we've done, we, we started our search of the audit trail with 420,000 lines. Once we used a pivot table by year, we narrowed our search down to only the 15,000 lines in, uh, of data in, in 15 and 16 that we wanted to look at further. And then we, we uh, looked at it another way. We narrowed our, our transaction from 25 to 15. And then we looked at it by transaction number to find about 50 or so transactions that had a high number of changes that we wanted to look into. And of that 50 that we looked at, 42 of those were fraudulent. And so, so your odds, once, you're, once you go through this analysis to, to identify red flags and anomalies and drill it down into a smaller data set, your, your chances of uncovering something increase exponentially. Um, for example, with 42 tech, 42 transactions divided by 420, 420,000 lines, that's not a very good odds of finding something fraudulent. But if you're looking at 50 transactions and 42 of them are fraudulent, uh, you can pretty much close your eyes and throw a dart at that point and you'll, you'll find it. So, um, so that's my, my presentation. I'll, I'll take some remaining questions. I think we're running short on time. I've got, I've got more time if we need, but um, I want to respect your time as well. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Luke before we let him go for the night? <laughs> uh, question is, uh, I'm Anil Singh. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you compare QuickBooks with the 
other ERPs uh, such as uh, SAP and uh, Oracle? Um, so I haven't dealt with a lot of companies that use Oracle or, or SAP or, or any of those big uh, accounting softwares. I, I have got into it a little bit, but QuickBooks is definitely more tailored to the the smaller businesses. Um, you'll see some of those other financial accounting systems in, in bigger, uh, maybe publicly traded companies. Um, but a lot of times the analysis is going to be the same, whether it's yes. Oracle or whether it's QuickBooks. A lot of times you'll get the exported general ledger from whatever system they use into Excel. And then you're going to use Excel to, to analyze the data. Um, so, so with that, you, you could use a pivot table to recreate the financial statements uh, or recreate any of that data and, and review it. And I can uh, also attest to that because I did in my audits use uh, SAP and Oracle data and it all gets exported into Excel. Yep. What you'll look at, Anil, uh, with the larger companies, if you're doing an audit, you'll, you'll either be doing some kind of sampling. So you'll have, or if you uh, suspect fraud, you will have these large uh, data set. Sometimes you have to use something like Access or you have to import it into a, into some kind of software program. Yeah, but and, basically everything works the same. It's just the size of the, of the data that you have to deal with and whether yeah. you, whether with it works. It, Excel has a limit of, it's like yeah. a million 42,000 lines right. that you can have in an Excel file. And so a lot of times when you're working with these big companies, um, you'll have data sets that, that exceed that uh, significantly. Um, so I've, I've worked on some data sets that are like 100 million lines of data. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you at that point, you're going to have to review it in, in like Tableau or Power BI. Um, or in that case where it was 100 million, we, we imported it into a SQL database and use SQL queries to, to analyze it and export it. But then even then we, we exported pieces of it to Excel and analyzed it in Excel. Um, but another tool that you can use is called a power pivot table. And with a power pivot table, there's, there's not any real limitations to the, the data set. Um, so with power pivot tables, I've, I've imported 10 to 15 million lines of data. Uh, and you can import that right into Excel uh, it, it doesn't show up on the Excel spreadsheet, but it's in the background and it's just a reference to the data set. And then you can use a power pivot table to, to summarize it and, and analyze that data in Excel. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, what about the role of uh, artificial intelligence in uh, fraud detection? Yeah, it, it, that's definitely becoming a, a more used and, and popular tool uh, is, is relying upon machine learning and artificial intelligence to, to kind of do some of that initial upfront analysis. Um, uh, it, it's still a little bit more sophisticated for, for the, the investigations that I'm currently doing, um, but it's, it's definitely out there and, and we're pursuing those avenues. But yeah, it's becoming more and more common. Uh, there's, there's a presentation that I'm attending next month that deals with uh, deep fraud technology and, and committing fraud uh, and how that's becoming more prevalent. Um, so, so yeah, times are changing and, and the fraudsters are using more sophisticated tools and, and as, a, as an investigator and, and fraud fighter, then we need to also use more investigative and advanced tools to find them. Thank you. Look, I have a question on average, how long does it take uh, for for you to be able to go from start to finish of you know investigating a, a particular case like in this case although you you looked at a wide range of years from the time you started the project to when you analyzed and came to a conclusion over what time period would that be yeah it definitely varies case by case um, in this one it was it was really quick so okay. by the time we got in to by the t to when we were in court and, and showing all of this this stuff to a judge, uh, it was it was like a few months from from start to finish. Uh, other cases that I've worked on have been going on for years, and there's still no end in, end in sight. Uh, it just really depends on on the data that's available and the amount of investigation that has to occur, and and the willingness of parties to to cooperate. 
Look, uh, a question is, uh, uh, the accountant was let go and uh, the owner, the brother and uh, the client you have, do they actually press a charge on this, this case and uh, got the, you know, the, the restitution back for their economic monetary damage? That's a question one. Second one, uh, that probably some of our accounting students thinking about, well, they are not particular technologies, let's savvy. Uh, they know how to use probably Excel or a pivot table, but when you come to need to image the database, like your, your IT team use, of course you got the permission from the owner, but uh, if an accounting student do not have uh, such a technology background, uh, is it, is it required or is it recommend that we all need to learn those technology or you, you, your personal uh, uh, suggestion will be to hire independent IT team. They are specialized in this area. Uh, yeah, so, so the first question, uh, they did pursue action against the accountant and, and she's making payments on, on those. Uh, she didn't serve any jail time as far as I'm aware of, um, but she agreed to pay it all back. Um, and so she's making those payments. Uh, I, I believe that the IRS has investigated her and uh, is going to pursue her for unpaid taxes because she didn't pay taxes on the $330,000. Um, so there's, there's that going on. But, but yeah, the, all of the issues between the brothers got resolved um, and the accountant will pay them back. Um, so, so that worked out well for our client. He got more than, than the initial offer that his brother asked him um, significantly more than, than that. And then with this bonus of the 330 being paid back. So he was in a good spot. Uh, and then as far as uh, understanding or having learning about uh, imaging hard drives, and, and if you need to know that, uh, you, you don't. Uh, so I don't know how to image a hard drive. We, we went in there with a team that's it's not, it's not a team of Sage. It was, it was another firm. That, that did the imaging and the, the computer forensics. Um, that's kind of outside of the realm of expertise of my, my, my expertise or, or those of a typical accounting uh, professional. Uh, so, so yeah, I would recommend just this relying upon a computer forensics team to, to handle that. You don't, you don't need to know everything there is to know about imaging a hard drive or computer forensics. Um, but it is, it is helpful to know what can be done. Uh, so like one of the students said, uh, once you delete something, it's not actually deleted until it gets rewritten. Uh, so it's helpful to kind of have a basic understanding of, of what's possible so that you know if something is deleted that, that there's still a chance you could get it back and then you can hire the right people to, to go in there and get that data. Yeah, thank you so much. Because yeah. this, this, this is so, uh, I'm so excited to, to, to <laughs> learn today from this case. As our forensic accounting class, we use some you know, many case study from each chapter. And uh, your case actually covers several different kinds of uh, yeah. uh, case study we actually has. Uh, we, we, we even have a case about, you know, he, the, the boss as the, the, the three morons to turn in whatever the, the, the file they, they need to turn in, but they just keep delaying. So it's pretty much tied with that because, you know, that, that's exactly, there's just, uh, right, right over there. And also about the side business, about you have a very trusted employee that been there for, for long tenure and uh, then turn out to be the most trusted employee. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the, 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 the problem. So yeah, I think that ties so much with our, you know, our, our accounting class. Thank yeah. you. And I'll add one thing about the bookkeeper. This bookkeeper had been there for 30 years, but in my experience, one thing that I found is, is that a lot of embezzlers are serial embezzlers. So I actually uh, did an audit on a lawyer where uh, the bookkeeper was embezzling him to pay back a church that hmm. she had embezzled from. So uh, it's very important uh, if you're going into public accounting, uh, your clients, that they do some background checks because many times they hire people based on word of mouth mm -hmm. and these people typically if they're embezzlers they go from from one company to the next they get good at it and um, so that would be 
one thing that I would mention to you guys is if you uh, go into public accounting, make sure you tell your clients they need to uh, check these people out. Unfortunately, a lot of them do embezzle from churches and churches uh, a lot of times do not prosecute the people. Uh, they'll seek restitution and if they agree to uh, pay the restitution, they will not prosecute them. And so the people will have no criminal background, no criminal record. But uh, like I say, this lady was stealing from the attorney to pay the restitution to the church. So there's a, there's a lesson for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. So thank you, Luke, for your time. Uh, thanks everybody for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I know I did, and I learned a lot about it. And I think it is applicable, like Dr. Shao said, to what we're learning in class, uh, the computer skills, how important they are, as well as being, um, you know, vigilant to pick up on these red flags when you're uh, out there doing your uh, accounting work. Many times these frauds are going to be discovered like Luke did when you're doing another type of engagement like the business valuation. So Luke, do you have anything you'd like to say to kind of wind down and I think we've covered it. Yeah, just, just focus on those power pivot skills and your Excel skills because those are going to be crucial no matter what industry or, or career you end up going down. Pretty much you can guarantee that you're going to use Excel or some sort of Excel related task. So we'll brush up on those and get good at it. Thank you, Luke. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you uh, in class. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Vicky. Thank, Thank you, Danny.